Okay, the basic concept, I call this the neuroecology concept. What, what is it? The, uh -oh. okay, the, in the last, well, three cases or so, we and many others have shown that the electrical activity of the developing brain differs from the adults. In essence, the developing brain is not a small adult brain. It's a brain which has unique electrical, biological, biochemical features, which you usually don't find in more adult brains. And the question I've been asking myself for a long time was, uh, if this is the case, why do you have a different activity in the developing brain? What's the aim of this? Or what's the links between the activity and the so-called genetic program in which I'm not completely convinced. Anyhow, what's the relationship between both of these issues? I'll give you one example just to illustrate this. This is a preterm baby. And then we flash a flash of light, as you can see here. This response is called retinal waves. It's very long lasting. With this, you would not see me and I would not see you. Retinal waves are observed in every animal species during evolution. It has been preserved and conserved throughout evolution. It's a long lasting response, which doesn't allow to see, but which is crucial. Uh, Rakish and many others have shown that if you lesion the retinal neutral, the visual system doesn't develop. Our retina roughly matures around the end of the first trimester. Now, in rats or mice, you can do the same experiment recording the visual response and the response evoked by a flash of light. As you can see here, at P8, you have a retinal wave. At P14, when the eyes are open, you have a conventional short-lasting response. The animal prepares himself to see. And we have shown this is the fact in due to the fact that ret retina is immature, unable to generate the sort of activity required for vision. It's a sort of barrier. Because if you stimulate the optic track, you have the correct response. Now, what I have suggested with my friend Nick Spitzer is a concept called the checkpoint concept. Basically, the idea is gene and activity operate in series, not in parallel. It's not you press a button and you have gene A, gene B, gene C, and you have a brain. The ionic current operates like a sort of GPS, providing the information needed for correct connections. Basically, what I'm trying to say is the system behaves like this. It's as if you have a huge symphony orchestra going to play, I don't know, the second Brahms concerto with Yasha Hefetz in the violin, preferably. And during repetition, they play something else. You have group playing jazz or whatever. And then when times come, they play the correct uh, concerto. When the Brits and the French were digging the channel, they met exactly the same spot because of GPS. Otherwise, they would not have met at the same spot. So the idea is that perhaps activity is playing a sort of GPS role, validating the genetic information. They operate in series, not in sequence. Now, the consequence is what I've called the neuroarchaeology concept, which is really archaeology, basically. The idea is simple. If you have an insult in utero, and if you have developmental sequences, what is the insult going to do? What is going to perturb this sequence? At the end of the day, you're going to have cells which have not matured adequately, which have not connected adequately. I have suggested that they remain immature in 208 when I publish this concept. They remain immature, and they are really the cause of the disorder. This has important implication. It means that all the data on genetic stuff of autism in therapeutic perspective are not useful. Because if the mutation is, is generated in utero, you have a cascade of events, and what you're going to treat really is not the gene or the protein, but the consequences of that mutation. This is what he suggests. Now, we have proven this in a variety of conditions, experimental, of course. For instance, if you want to, uh, if you create a mice with double cortex, you know, double cortex is a mutation where the cells do not migrate because of lack of protein. It's a really genetic disorder. In, in infant having this, they're epileptic, they're retarded. And the only solution is to remove the cortical column in which the cells, as you can see here, they remain on the corpus callosum instead of migrating, basically, when, when you do this. Now, if you take a slice 
with those cells here, which are the corpus callosum instead of being here in layer six and five, if you patch those cells, they are immature. They generate electrical activity that you would not see in the normal brain. By the way, in, again, in the infant having this, when you remove the cortex, the surrounding of the cortex have some immature properties. If the baby or the kid is epileptic, you are going to block seizures. So they are generated from here. The insult is coming from that column. And my suggestion is that the immature properties of these immature neurons or neurons which have remained immature are really the problem via their connection, via their activity, via their biochemistry, whatever. One of the most convincing evidence for all this story is what we discovered more than three decades ago. We started recording immature neurons in the hippocampus, the cortex, and other brain regions, and we discovered that neurons in the developing brain have depolarizing gamma, or excitatory gamma instead of inhibitory gamma, because they have high levels of chloride inside. And this is due to a, these two co-transporter. This one imports chloride, NKCC1, one sodium, one potassium, two chloride. And this one exports chloride, one pota two potassium and two chloride. In the developing brain, this one is very active, and this one is not. So chloride accumulates. When chloride accumulates, on GABA activate the receptor, you have an efflux of chloride instead of an influx. In the adult, this one works a lot. The levels of chloride are low, five, six, seven millimolar, and then GABA inhibits because chloride goes in, it's an anion. This property has been observed in every animal species investigated from frogs to fish to chicken, whatever. It has been preserved throughout evolution. I won't have time to talk about what does this mean? It's related to the trophic action of GABA on development, which have been repeatedly investigated. Basically, GABA activated in the air receptor, calcium channel, calcium goes in, and you have trophic actions. And then at a given moment, there is a shift. Chloride is evacuated. And I have suggested this makes sense in the sense that the alternative of keeping excitation inhibition balance is totally inadequate because you would have to genetically determine rigidly thousands of proteins of synaptic proteins of the baby. Here you have a, a linear the capacity of modifying things. It's initially like this and progressively it goes like that. <coughs> when you have sufficient amount of glutamate, an inhibition is needed. So we started measuring reduction of chloride by the best method available, which is single channel recording. It's a complicated method, which people don't use usually, but it's the only one that allows really to measure chloride. When you do this, we expect it to have a curve like that. You have high chloride and it progressively goes down until adult or, or whatever. We discovered that during delivery, here I'm talking about 24 hours during parturition and birth, there is a very abrupt shift of chloride, which goes to levels which are amazingly low. The editor of the journal told me, Professor Berry, this is impossible. Therm thermodynamically, it's impossible. I told him, no, facts are stubborn. Uh, uh, this is an observation. I won't answer like Galileo or Porsimove, but this is the observation and it's a fact. If you put an oxytocin antagonist, you block this shift. So it's oxytocin doing it. Then we discover that oxytocin might have a neuroprotective action because if you produce anoxia in vitro, you have a response which is called the anoxia depolarization. And this is aggravated if oxytocin is blocked. By, by the way, by antagonists given to women who are touching labor too early. Why is that? Now the Swedes in Kaoliska have done a series of experiments which I consider absolutely fundamental. What they have done is simply measuring stress molecule during parturition. Here I'm talking about the baby, not the mother. If you measure catecholamine and stress molecule, the amount of catecholamine in the baby are amazingly elevated. You can see it here. They are higher than anything we're going to experience in our lives. They are much higher than the mother during parturition or the Swedes doing five hours of sauna. I don't know what they're fascinating by sauna, but anyhow. Any tough thing you do, you won't reach that level. And the question was, obviously, why does the baby need to have that amount of stress molecule? And the answer, apparently, it helps the lungs to expel surfactant and all the rest in order to be able to breathe. Now, the problem is, 
that the brain doesn't like that. In other words, during evolution, somebody had to find a solution to the problem, which is I need a lot of molecules to, for the lungs, but I must protect the brain from the whatever comes from these stress molecules. With these levels of stress molecules, probably would have had seizures. So what we have done, then, then came an interesting observation, again by the Swedes. If you measure pain in just born baby, facial expression or vocalization, you need to take blood for the uh, factor K or whatever. The pain is much more severe in C-section than vaginal delivery, both in terms of vocalization and in terms of facial expression. And then I decided to check this in mice or rats. So you do a very simple experiment at birth, a couple of hours after birth. You put the tail in hot water and he is going to remove it. It's very crude, very simplistic, of course. When you do this, you measure the latency of tail removal. You find that if you block oxytocin, the tail is removed much faster, pain is bigger. If you put bevetanide, which is an antagonist of NKCC1, which reduces cellular chloride, pain is less severe. And the same is with oxytocin. Oxytocin and bevetanide do more or less the same thing. By reducing chloride, they attenuate the severity of pain. Now, the most important experiment was the following one. Why is that? We recorded three germinal sensory neurons. So the pain neurons. And we discovered that in pain neurons during birth, GABA is excitatory and depolarizing, as you can see here. Oxytocin reduces the depolarization and shifts GABA from high chloride to low chloride. In other words, oxytocin, like the metanide, acts on sensory pathways to reduce pain at birth, meaning that oxytocin at birth triggers delivery, at least in part, with vasopressin, has an analgesic action by reducing chloride in pain pathway, and has, in addition, probably a protection of the brain to the excess stress that occurs. Now, of course, it's oversimplified. This is mice, and nobody is going to compare the pain of a woman giving birth and, and a mouse. But this is the idea. So what this means is that GABA excites neurons, it has been preserved throughout evolution. Now, birth, birth and parturition are very important events, and I'm going to talk about this more. Because oxytocin, in addition to doing all this, exert analgesic action. I'm talking about the baby again, not the mother. It might be that it does the same thing in the mother, but this we have not tested. And all these effects are really mediated by chloride level circulation. Meaning that the regulation of chloride level is very important in all these situations. Now, of course, I'm talking about chloride levels. I could have said perhaps the same thing with potassium, carbon, and gonosite. I'm talking about this because this is the one I have investigated. And it's, at least until now, this is a phenomenon which has been most frequently reported in the literature, which, which I think there is a global agreement that chloride levels are instrumental during development. Now, how and when did I go to autism? Now, this was a meeting with a guy called Le Monnier, who is a pedopsychiatrist, because I'm not a psychiatrist. And we, we started from a very, very naive idea. He convinced me, in fact, because I wasn't convinced initially. And this is 10 years ago. Children or infants having autism, it has been reported that if you give them volume, some of them, instead of going to sleep, they are over agitated. And this experimentally has been shown by me and many others to be due to high chloride. The idea is very simple. If GABA excites and you give benzodiazepine which acts via GABA, you're going to overexcite. This is a very simplistic idea. Because of course, I have no idea if chloride is elevated in children. There's no way I can do the measurements because I need slices, brain slices, etc. There's no way you can measure it adequately in vivo. Now, we came to this via this stuff. We, this is a paper I published a couple of years ago, and it's already insufficient. I simply listed here all the disorders in which chloride is elevated and GABA excites again, like immature cells. Seizures, autism, red, fragile X, brain damage, traumatic insult, spinal cord lesions, cerebral vascular infarct, chronic pain, stress, 
post-traumatic stress disorder, immune activation, Parkinson's, in which I'm working on, et cetera, et cetera. In all these conditions, you have a situation in which apparently some neurons, if not in many neurons, chlorine is again elevated. I'm not saying they become young. I'm saying there is a deficiency in the regulation of chlorine. Starting from this, we decided to look if reducing chloride might help. And we use bimetanide. It's an agent which has been synthesized, fabricated by Roche four decades ago. It's a very specific antagonist of NKCC1. It has been shown by hundreds of labs that it reduces chloride. And nobody is debating that issue. So the idea is this. Young neuron has high chloride, adult neuron has low chloride, and therefore inhibitory gamma. In autism, some neurons might have again high chloride. And if you block NKCC1, you have again efficient inhibition and inhibitory gamma. This has been validated in many animal models. Fragile X, valproid in utero, Red syndrome, we published a paper recently, and maternal immune activation, which as you know, is one of the classical way of having in, in women or in mice, or rats, uh, autistic features. In all these cases, GABA in hippocampal and cortical neurons excites because of high Now, of course, all oh, this is well, but what about humans? <laughs> now, as you know, English is French spoken with a funny accent. So I'm sure you're going to understand, but I'm going to translate. The lady here is trying to convince Alan to come along and let's uh, feed this baby because it's his birthday. And I'm sure you're more expert than I am and you realize the autistic uh, features of this kid. And on the breast cake, I put the candle. Put the candle. <clears throat> no eye communication, of course. <clears throat> she is very patient. Okay. This is three months later, one milligram of better during three months, morning and evening. Let's make a cake for birthday. I put the candle. Do you want to put the candle? He puts the candle. Bravo. I switch on some of the candles. It's very hot. And we think, happy birthday to you, etc. Let's take off the candles. Baby is hungry. Look at visual communication between them. <clears throat> now, I, I am I'm completely atheistic. I don't believe in miracles. This kid was not talking, and he's still not talking. I mean, nobody is claiming that he is cured. In fact, one of the consequences of neuroecology concept is that these kids are not going to be really cured. They're going to be attenuated, ameliorated, treated, not cured. Now, of course, one case is not convincing. So we did a couple of double phase 2A and B trials. This is one of them in one, in one uh, CRA, uh, Autism Research Center. This is CARS, you know, I'm, I'm sure you know better than I do. This is a decrease in CARS score and every column is another child. And this is from three to 11, if I remember well. You have three doses of bimetanide, 0.5, one and two, twice a day, morning and evening. This is diuretic. So morning, they go to the loo, they go to the college, whatever, and everything is fine. Uh, bumetanide 1, bumetanide 2, and placebo. As you can see here, all the cases in which there is a very significant reduction in scars are treated, not placebo. There is only one placebo here in which uh, 
placebo was very efficient. Now, the side effects are known. Of course, diuresis and dehydration. This is why with two milligrams, there is a lot of dropouts because two milligrams for this kid is too much. We're going to concentrate on half a milligram twice a day. Then we did SRS from the parents. And this is even more spectacular because you can see here, the change in SRS are 12, 13, and 21 points, and only 155 point in placebo. According to the FDA, this is far more than what's needed. They, I think that SRS, more than 10 points is significant amelioration. So you have a very significant amelioration with SRS and with scars and with uh, other uh, measures. In the meantime, there have been a total of nine studies or pilots or double blind in China and Oxford, in Holland, in, uh, in Sweden, etc. In Holland, the one in Holland is very interesting. And they confirm that the metanide does attenuate. Now, some of them are pilot, a few cases, for instance, the Swedes with Gilbert took six very severely impacted autistic children, and it did work very efficiently. Uh, by the way, the parents usually want to, con to go on continuing once the trial is, is ended. So we fabricated a liquid formulation because the, the kids do not very much like the pills. So we fabricated a liquid formulation. This is sufficient for one month. It took me a year to have something approved, a lot of money, to have something approved which is stable in color, taste, and content for up to two and a half years at room temperature. And this is a very important trial to make it a good trial. The syringe is correct with a plastic insert, avoiding microbial and all the rest. And the kids love the taste. In fact, it happens now and then that they drink more than they, they should when the parents are not behind. This sort of thing happens. So we patent this formulation and autism in a variety of countries, and we did a phase 2B study. Of course, one must do a phase three, and this is far beyond my means. So we signed with Servier French Pharma an agreement where we license, we sold the license for Europe, only for Europe. We have the license in the US, Japan, Canada, China, Australia, and Russia, but we sold the license for Europe and for Korea recently. And the phase three trial is 422 children in 40 centers in Europe, including England, uh, from 2 to 18 years old, all the pediatric population, because the EMA wanted the entire population, which of course is complicated because you cannot make one trial exactly on, on, on uh, the different ages like this. So we split the trial in two groups, 2 to 6 and 7 to 18. And the trial is very complicated because you have six months double blind randomized on the two groups, 2 to 6 and 7 to 18, and six months open because the EMA wanted some kids to have one year the agent to see what happens when you take it for one year. So we have recruited 422 children, 211 in each group. Luckily enough, not one of them had a severe problem and recruitment is finished and the results in a month or two or three, not more. I'm going then to start sleeping because of course, I'm not too used to making clinical trials. And this was a very big effort and investment because I don't know if you have made these sort of things, but when you are a basic scientist, to learn patents, shares, rights, and all the rest is a headache. So during two years, I almost did nothing else than that. If the results are successful, we're going to have the first approved treatment for autism, at least in Europe for core symptoms of autism. Which of course, for a basic scientist like me, reaching that phase is, is not frequent, based on concept which I have developed. Now, in parallel, Nushi Gajikani, which we see here, an expert of imaging, she did a trial on, on 10 adolescents, showing emotive figures or neutral ones, and asking the kids to recognize the figures and the neutral ones. And the answer, the, there was a very significant difference in recognizing the ladies here, not the neutral pictures. And then what she did on the same kids, uh, visual active, fMRI activation of visual areas by emotive figures after treatment versus before. And you have more activation of visual areas 
What's particularly interesting is what's shown here below, is that the time needed to recognize the uh, images, uh, emotive figures, is, is really shorter in addition to the specificity. But if you ask the kids to uh, constrain eye contacts, they must look at the eyes. The amygdala is less activated after the better eye in constrained eye contact. I've been working on amygdala for two decades when I was much younger. I'm sure we realize the importance of the amygdala in all these systems. This suggests, it doesn't prove anything, but it suggests that perhaps something does take place with the better eye facilitating the visual contact and removing the uh, pain or suffering that some of the kids have when they have to look at the eyes. This paper by the Dutch group is very interesting. What they did, Brüning et al. in Utrecht, they took TSC, tuberous sclerosis children, I think it's 13 patients with TSC, and they gave them a the same liquid formulation that I showed before. And what they observed is that autistic syndrome are ameliorated with these three scales, but the seizures are not. And this is expected. I published a couple of papers in a mouse showing that the recurrence of seizures augments chloride, therefore attenuating the likelihood that metalite will work. So the autistic, the autistic features are ameliorated, not the seizures, which is what we could have anticipated. Now, the, the figure here is interesting. Sorry. The figure here is interesting because here it's a 10 years old girl with this mutation, duplication, and she had a very paradoxical reaction to better the acid. She would wake up and, and whatever, instead of really the typical case of excitatory gamma, probably. What he showed, Brüning and his colleague, was the EEG has different gamma oscillations and beta oscillation, and this was ameliorated by metanide. Now, I like this very much because I have nothing against pedopsychiatrists, but EEG is a language that I understand more, basically. It's more, how should I say, objective. So this suggests that even on the EEG, the metanide has an effect. By the way, they have a paper which soon is going to be impressed, the same Dutch group, where analyzing the EEG of larger populations, they show that you can predict on which adolescent bimetanide is going to work, and which it's not going to work, relying on AG measures. So this suggests that perhaps bimetanide does activate syndromes. There is a conversion of many labs, many institutions, many clinical trials. Side effects are present, but they are limited. They're far less than the conventional apriprazole or whatever that those kids take. If Phase three is confirmed, I hope that it will be, we'll have the first wind of course symptoms of ASD in Europe and I hope in the US. Now, this was an illustration of the neuroecology concept. Now, the second question I asked from the beginning is the following one. If one accepts the idea that autism is so-called born in the womb, which I think most people would agree with, so there's plenty of evidence around these lines, then we reason that perhaps it's possible to identify babies at risk at birth instead of later, which of course would have some important advantages because then, then it might be possible to intervene early with psychoeducative techniques, etc. So what, what I decided to do is the following one. I'm not at all a mathematician, but I'm going to show the results of the reasoning we had. We have collected maternity data, all maternity data. In France, it's almost 115 parameters, biological, ecography, biochemical, the mothers, whatever, which are routinely available. I did not want to have special things requiring money or requiring whatever, things which are routinely done, routinely done in maternities. Then we went back. Uh, when the children were diagnosed with ASD, we went back to the maternity and took the files of kids with ASD, of babies at birth with ASD, and babies at birth in the same maternity without ASD, roughly one to three. In other words, we had something like 60 ASD children and 180 non-autistic children born in the same maternity in the same conditions, 
in terms of age of the mother, etc. And I demanded the uh, mathematicians to write a program which can analyze all these data. You realize it's a lot, 500 uh, files with 120 parameters is, is a lot. To analyze it without any a priori. So I did not ask the obstetrician to say, well, you know, if you have CNV, if you have this and that, no, blind. And he wrote this really genius guy, a machine learning program that classify those parameters completely blindly. Basically what he does, he takes 90% of the files, 10% are hidden, and then the computer must confirm with the 90% what you have is the 10% in which ASD versus non-ASD is, is noted. And I asked this classifier, which we call the genesis classifier, to classify impacting parameters out of the 116 or 20, which ones are really impacting for the, now it's not a diagnosis, of course, it's a prognosis. So the uh, neurotypical group was 189. The ASD was 63. Well, as you can see, you have more males than females, of course. Uh, and the, the, the parameters were mother age, parakeetons, were equal in, in both groups. Now the parameters measured 77 of them were numerical parameters that you could quantify, ultrasound, et cetera. Uh, 39 were categorical parameters, familiar medical history, fetal heart rate injury, labor, et cetera. And then what the program had to do was to tell us if you can separate these two populations. So you have an automatic classification of the subject, info about the parents, measurement during pregnancy. Now, I want to insist, there's no way you can use this before birth. Birth is included. I'm not, I'm not against abortion, but I don't want abortion for their own reasons. The neutral parameters are insufficient. You need the whole story. Delivery measurement and measurement one day after birth. So you need all this to be able to have a prognosis. And the goal was to see if you can have an early prognosis at birth from these routinely collected parameters. So when you do this, I can say to the mother, the day of birth, one day after, roughly 100% of the babies, I can tell them he will not be autistic, roughly 100%. 41% are detected properly. Properly means completely. They will be autistic. But it's a pronostic, of course. You need a diagnostic to confirm, et cetera. And it's 41% for various reasons, and one of them being that the number of cases I have are insufficient. Now, 25% of the ones that we have diagnosed as probably being autistic are not going to be autistic. So we have a mistake of 25%, but we have a correct rate of 41%. Of course, it's limited. There's no doubt that this is preliminary. The parameters are completely around the loop, so to speak. I, I mean, there is no way you can understand. I don't understand. Femur size second trimester, nose bone second trimester, fetal rotation, they rotate earlier than the non-typical the ones. Temperature difference between birth and one day later. I have no idea what this means. This makes perhaps more sense. Fetal heart rate during labor and CMV. Mother immunized. We did not find viral serology in, in, in the baby. So the mother, when they're immunized, it seems that it impacts in favor of, of what is there. This is more around the thing I like doing because I'm more familiar with this. What we did here is a complete measurement of head circumference from the first to a couple of days or weeks before birth. As you can see here, you have the classical picture. When it gets bigger and then it slows down, probably in preparation for birth. Now, if you take the whole autistic group, and the whole non-autistic group, there is a, a small but significant difference before birth, as if it seems that the autistic brain before birth are bigger than an artistic brain. But the difference is small but significant. However, if you, if you take now the subpopulation of autistic future children who have really a big brain, 38%, 
already neutral. And if you separate them from the rest of the autistic children, then you have a very significant difference already at the first trimester. So in other words, you have a subpopulation of future autistic children, which in utero have a bigger brain already in the first trimester and much more so before delivery. Now, this suggests, doesn't prove, but it suggests that perhaps the bigger brain reported by a variety of groups, Amaral, Kuksha, and others, in fact, started already in utero. Growth is impacted by whatever insult has been generating autism later. Things start in utero. Now, of course, what is the relationship between this and parturition and birth? And it's important because you know better than I do, of course, that for instance, preterm baby are more frequently autistic, etc. What's the relationship between the in utero insult and parturition and birth? Which is an important question. Well, first let's summarize the results. Almost all NT can be detected, 40, 41%. We hope to reach soon 50%. Maternal parameters are the ones which are routinely collected. We did not take anything special. There are major limitations. Uh, small sample, single maternity, uh, very few girls, and li links between impacted parameters are completely ununderstandable. But brain growth is clearly impacted already early on. This is very clear. Now, what can we do on parturition now in birth? It's an important question. Why? Because let's imagine you have an insult in utero and then parturition comes. Does this insult in utero modify the conditions? of birth and punctuation. This is, a, a very, I think, a very important question. That you can investigate it in mice or rats. What you are seeing here is a very nice, I think, a very nice experiment in which what we did is the following. We measured the volume of the hippocampus cortex striatum and ventricle in control mice one day before birth and one day after. And in VPA, VPA, as you know, is there will be autistic. So we measure. E21 and P0. So in other words, one day before, one day after. The volumes of the brains continue growing in autistic, not in controls. So in other words, during parturition, the offspring who are going to be autistic continue growing during parturition and birth in volume. What is more important is here. If you patch neuron in the hippocampus or in the cortex and you reconstruct them, you put dyes inside, etc. What you see is that neurons in controls are the same size before and after birth. They are not modified in size. Neurons in the VPA model are smaller before and bigger after. In other words, neuron grow. Dendrites grow during parturition and birth in autism. During parturition and birth in autism. Of course, it's not humans, so I cannot say much about humans, but it strongly suggests that the process in itself is impacted. And my suggestion is that parturition and birth attenuate or aggravate the insult which has taken place earlier on. There is a link between them somehow, which I cannot define, of course, but this is what this picture suggests. The second data in this direction, if you remember what I said earlier, there was an abrupt reduction of chloride during delivery due to oxytocin in VPA mice and fragile X, this, uh, this uh, abrupt fall is abolished. There is no abrupt fall. You have, uh, you have this. In fact, you have, they remain excitatory for a long time. If you give metanide, you restore this abrupt shift and then the animals here are not anymore autistic to cut a long story short. So in other words, there is something taking place here during this period. Now, there are two issues. One is what happens before. I think what happens before impacts what happens here. And what happens here impacts the, the consequences. There is, I have no way of understanding how an event during such a small period of time can have such long-term consequences. But McCarthy gave a talk in your place some time ago, and perhaps she provided the answer. By giving PGA2, she shows that a single injection modify what happens later. Perhaps this is the issue, because this is really only less than 24 hours. How could this impact 
something which occurs much later. Perhaps there is a consequence of inflammation and all the rest. But this, of course, is, is a conjecture. So what I'm saying from all this, my conclusions are, I think that the neuroecology concept paves the way to see differently how neurodevelopmental disorders appear. I think that one cannot concentrate on the initial cause of the disorder. For me, it's meaningless. You have now thousands of mutations linked to autism, and there's not a single treatment based on that information, to the best of my knowledge. I think it's a mistake to concentrate on this. What's important is what modification are produced by, by the initial cell. Now, the beta ride is a promising treatment. There is more eye contact, etc. Now, the main problem is beta ride, and this doesn't concern you, but it's a problem because I'm financing my own research. I don't know if you know, but in France, when you are retired, and this is my case, I'm 78 years old, you cannot ask grants. So all I'm saying here, we have paid from the licenses we obtained, which is not a very frequent situation. Usually when you have a clinical trial, which successfully have some money, you buy a yacht and you go to the Bahamas, which is not exactly what they want to do. So all the money goes for basically. Now the problem is metadite, it's a generic drug. It's very difficult to raise funds from it by saying that whatever. I think that you can make a prognosis early on at birth I'm looking forward to, by the way, repeat these measures in England, perhaps if somebody is interested. All you have to do is collect the data and send it to us. We will do the mathematical analysis. The Dutch and the Swedes seem to be interested. England, for the moment, I have no reply, but I would be very interested. Simply to repeat this, because there are a couple of differences between, I guess, maternity parameters in your country and mine. But it doesn't matter. If the number of cases is sufficient, we might identify similarities and differences between our both countries in terms of the impact on parturition and uh, uh, prognosis. I'm suggesting that parturition and birth might attenuate or aggravate the pathogenic sequence, and therefore you must investigate everything from, from in year to two, one day after birth. And as I said, I'm not a genetomaniac. I think that the money invested in genetic approaches in a treatment perspective is very limited. I think it's time perhaps to think about something slightly more, how should I say, uh, general, global, rather than the initial insult. This, all of what I've said was done by this group. Now, as I said, none of them is academic. They're all paid by the company, which is not very frequent. I'm doing a lot of very crazy basic things. Uh, I could talk about all sorts of crazy experiments we're doing now, which are completely useless in terms of funds, but I think life is short and one should do what he likes. And if I can afford this, why not? Basically a very terrific team. Of course, working with psychiatrists at distance, with uh, uh, maternities, we're going to have to repeat in four or five maternities in France our prognosis and perhaps in other countries as I said. And I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you.